you have a need, you have a growth, you have uh, performance issues that you want to keep stable. So we'll be bringing the board, uh, my administration will be bringing the board a very uh, substantial CIP <coughs> that we think will fit into uh, solving your problems on growth policy and solving our problems with getting everybody having a seat. And we think it's the best time for the taxpayers because of the cheap construction rates and the cheap bond rates. So it all fits. Uh, Mike Knapp, I think you had a question or comment. I know I had an opportunity to watch the board's discussion of the AGP and, and, and your, how you got the CIP recommendation, which you were part of to get to, I think. Um, the question I have is, I guess, twofold. One, um, the revenue projections we've seen, while I agree with you, the, the, the assumptions that you've made or the things you're seeing are, are real. Our revenue projections are flat to declining, which then wouldn't necessarily point to increasing your affordability guidelines because we don't necessarily have the resources to show we can pay for it. So have you had conversations with the executive branch as it relates to those projections? But second, have, um, the executive branch currently has a lot of very ambitious capital projects. And so have you started conversations yet um, with them as to what you think your capital needs are going to look like because near as I can tell, the amount of money they're looking to try and spend on some of their things are going to run smack dab into um, the stuff that you guys are talking about. And I haven't heard a real conversation yet about, especially from that side, as to how those pieces coincide. So I just know if you guys appreciate that conversation yet or we would. Uh, on the first thing, Mike, yes, I have. I've, I've talked to the executive and his team about these issues. And as you remember, the executive was on your body for a number of years and was uh, faced with the same kind of thing way back in the 80s and 90s and led the charge, if I remember and the papers are correct, about it is the time to build. Things are cheaper, things are better, and those kind of things. Now, as far as the second part about their ambitious plan, uh, that may have some... Uh, there may be some tension with their ambitious plan and our plan, uh, but you have, to, and that will come before you. I hope both plans make it to you. <coughs> our plan is born out of the kids that are already here. Mm -hmm. You have 10,000 children or greater in mobile classrooms. You have a lot of aging buildings and HVAC structures, and it doesn't look like things are going to get any uh, less student-oriented. Uh, his plans, uh, of course, uh, were not against economic development at all, but his plans are, um, <coughs> he will have to front them as to what, what creates uh, something as he proposes those to do. You know, I, I, and you will be the body, I think, that will have to decide. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I do hope that you see every way you can, though, uh, to uh, hit this window of opportunity. If, if you don't hit it, you're going to wind up putting on a lot more mobile classrooms, and you're going to wind up uh, not being able to uh, keep up with the backlog of repairs. And that will be affecting your, uh, I think, uh, economic quality because so many people come here to not only get a good education but actually go to a building that is safe and economic. And uh, the board, I think, has done a marvelous job of translating your plan into green schools too and all of their uh, remodeling. And I think uh, that's a testimony to do that. And you won't get a chance to build those any cheaper than right now. I, I know you'll have to make decisions, but I know that you know the evidence and data are overwhelming on our side, uh, and I'm sure that they will have a good case for their plans too. But, uh, kids are here. Let me ask a quick question. George has a 
No, I don't. You did stretch me. No, okay. I was just eating. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> just around. That's, That's why I asked. Yeah. Um, I know that a significant percent of the enrollment increase last year was driven by students from private schools <coughs> leaving the private schools to come to into MCPS. <coughs> what are we seeing this year in terms of that trend? And, so uh, a little early to tell, but where we're at is I think probably the market share is a better way to reflect that, and that's where we're uh, going off to the more um, tense by using numbers and starting to talk about market share, and our share of the market was about 80% now, or it's about what? 85% now. For, yeah. for years, it's about 81. It's a big increase. Uh, yeah, so, so we are... Uh, we are gaining market share of <coughs> students across the county, and I think that's a, a, a better, more honest <coughs> way to take a look at it. You know, is what percentage of the total students in the county okay. now go to the public schools? Yeah, it's a substantial increase. Yeah, it's a substantial increase, and uh, I think probably uh, the economics in the next two years are not going to be uh, conducive. To that uh, percentage changing a great deal because we're hearing a lot from uh, families that were on the line of uh, having economic issues uh, dropping below that line uh, we are may have more children on free and reduced lunch this year than Washington DC has total students the total student population. And that is uh, a significant change. More students on free and reduced lunch than Frederick has students totally in Frederick County. Uh, and so our teachers have to have a good workplace to go to. And that's what we're talking about. And they are able to translate that into college level work. And I'm not just saying that. We, had, we bought uh, from the National Clearinghouse, uh, the records of our you know, past graduates, and they're getting degrees at a very high rate compared to the country. And I think that says something about the council's investment, the community's investment, <coughs> how the board is translated. Yeah. Are we up to about 40,000 now on the reduced meal? I'm afraid we're probably going to do that. And more than 40? Yeah, more than 40. <coughs> I'm, uh, I think we may exceed 141, we're right at 142 right now, but it's going to be somewhere around 141.5 on the total enrollment. So it's, uh, things are, uh, but I think because our staff, because our board had a strategic plan, I mean, they have an outcome-based plan that drives and that's the way we staff to make that plan work. Uh, we were able to do it this year without uh, many overs. That will not be possible in years further. And what I worry about with the construction and going back to that is that if you don't give them a seat and crowd them also into classrooms, I think there will be some penalty for that that we've got to, we've got to think through. Because I know you're not going to have any money for the next uh, two seasons. We talk about uh, where we're in right now. We have a freeze on that we put on before the school even opened. And we've got next year and the following year. And things do not look good for either of us. Nancy have her hand up. Uh, no, uh, Jerry answered my question. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, she, uh, she Pat, Neil, and Dr. Pat. Well, if you think about the enrollment, I mean, it really is key because when the county, when we peaked in the 70s, or I think 72 is when we peaked after the post World War II baby boom, we peaked at 127,000 students. Then we bottomed out at 90,000, and that's when the county closed 60 five schools throughout the county. I mean, at that point, then the growth was more in the up county outer areas. Our enrollment, I mean, it, to wit, the BCC cluster and the moratorium 
it's not an area where you have massive development. And it is an area, you know, we, down county we have reclaimed some schools and reopened them. I mean, Sergeant Shriver in the Wheaton cluster and um, 